Good morning, Heartland family, and welcome to Heartland Online. We are so excited that you chose to join us this morning. One of the things I absolutely love is to see where you're joining us from. So in the chat, man, just put your name. Tell us what city or what state or man, even what country you might be joining us from. Yes, welcome, guys. We're so happy you're here with us today. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Julie Crook. Um, this is my husband, Val, and we serve on the communications dream team here at Heartland Church. Um, you know, we've been coming here for a little over two years. We just absolutely love it. Um, we have three kids. We have a 16-year-old daughter that just got her license, so that's exciting and frightening Man, all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and also we have a 13-year-old daughter, and then our little son, um, he just turned five. Uh, how about 21 days? Yes, let me tell you about that. <laughs> so um, today starts the beginning of the, well, it's like the last week of the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, we've been coming and it has been awesome. We just want to encourage you and challenge you to come this week um, every day. You know, it does start at 6 a.m. during the weekdays and I'm not a morning person. He will tell you that, but they have the coffee ready for you and you just won't regret it. So we've been coming and you just start your day off right with um, praising the Lord and praying, and it has been awesome. So please join us, and to find out more, you can go online, heartlandchurch.com slash 21 days, no, 21 D-O-P. That is yes. right. 21 days of prayer has just been so awesome uh, for us. We've been coming, we've been here in the mornings together, um, so it's been a blessing, not only for us, but for our girls and our family, because yes. they've been coming, uh, and so we, uh, we hope to see you there. Guess what? Small group semester uh, begins for this spring, February 5th. And so if you want to register uh, to have a small group and or to sign up for small group training, then definitely in the text box, put groups. And then in the telephone number box, you put 68,000. So text group to 68,000 and we can help you get that situated. Now, if you are looking at us online, man, we want to invite you to come in person. Let me tell you something. There's space for you. We'd love to have you. We'd love to see you. So definitely uh, 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 come on out. Yeah, and if you guys are on like Facebook or YouTube right now, another way you could connect with us is subscribe, like the page. Um, for Heartland and then you won't miss anything. So that would be awesome. Let me tell you something. We love being on this journey with you. We absolutely love it. So now, you know what? Let's just head into service. Yeah, but 
together this morning and say, just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Say, just one word, and you revive every dream. Yes, you do, Jesus. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Yeah, and just one touch. And it was a part of that song that really, really blessed me as we were singing. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Is anybody standing in front of a mountain this morning that you need God to move? Well, we're declaring there's no mountain that's too big that our God can't move out of the way. As we're in this season of 21 days of prayer, it is important that we are believing God for something. And so we want to encourage you this morning. And we're praying, we're praying that God touches your heart in a special way and he, and he speaks to you in a special way in this season. And even now as we worship, we pray that God just has his way in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just see. 
his praise one more time. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's always so important to remember his sacrifice on the cross, to remember what he did, and to remember that he didn't have to do it, to remember that he had all power in his hands, and he humbled himself. He humbled himself and laid down his life for us. Let's just think about Jesus for a minute. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we love you. You are so worthy. Nobody like you in heaven and earth, Lord. Thank you. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the king of king praise forever praise forever to the king oh praise forever praise forever to the king one more time praise forever praise forever to the king Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
That song is over yet. Holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty? Come on, worthy. Worthy is the man. Worthy. Worthy is the man. You are holy. Can't move, right? I can't move. 
You don't need my help this morning. Can you lift your voice? Tell him how worthy he is. Thank you for putting us in our right mind. Thank you for giving us a sound mind. Thank you for giving us power and love. Now, Lord, we open our hearts to you today. We hold nothing back. We ask you to speak to us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, give God praise one more time. So good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome all of you who are joining us online. Come on, welcome our church family. We're glad you're here. And those of you who are here for the first time, so glad you're here as well. Welcome to Heartland Church. Hey, would you do me a favor today? I need you to definitely move in. There are still people looking for a seat. And if a family comes in looking for four seats, <laughs> it ain't going to work with one here, one there. So help me out. Move in. Fill up the extra seats. And uh, actually, when you go sit down in just a second, which you're doing right now, come on, bring the lights up. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to bring the hosts out. But squish together. I see a whole bunch of seats right in the middle here, and we're going to need your help today. All right? Thank you so much. All right, Harlan Church, if you're grabbing your seats, let's just put a big a hand of a round of applause for our God. Uh, I don't know what it took for you to get here today. I don't know what you went through this week, but I know that you are here, and we want to welcome you. Also, again, if you're online, we welcome you as well. And, of course, our first-time guests, let's put our hands together for our first-time guests as well. We are Travis and Bree Brown. Uh, we're uh, Dream Teamers, and we've been here for a long time. And, you know, this 21 days of prayer has been amazing. How many of you, this has been a blessing to go through 21 days of prayer with all those names on the walls, lifting everybody up? Amen, amen. When you came in today, hopefully you were able to pick up a welcome guide. And you'll notice that this week on the front of the welcome guide, there are some post-it notes. That's a great opportunity for you to bring your needs, the needs of people that you know, to 21 days of prayer. If you've been here, you know. If you haven't, please know that every single post-it in this room is being prayed for. Every prayer card down here on the front of this stage is being prayed for over and over again. And incredible breakthroughs are happening right now for people in this church, in this community, and all around the world. We are praying church, so you can put your prayer on that post-it or on the perforated card at the bottom of the connection card inside your worship guide. We'd also love to know more about you if you're here for the first time, so give us whatever information you're comfortable with. Drop that card in the offering box on your way out. We're going to have some great information this morning on Heartland News, so please turn your attention to the screen. everyone, my name is Kayla, and I serve on the communications dream team here at Heartland. Whether you're attending in person or joining online, we are so glad you're here. Today begins our final week of 21 days of prayer, and it's gone by so quickly. We are already seeing God meet us in powerful ways, and there's still a whole week to go if you missed it. We invite you to come and set aside this valuable time every morning to pray, and especially encourage you and your whole family to make it out to the finale this Saturday at 9 a.m. Let's finish strong. If you'd like to learn more, just check out heartlandchurch.com. Here at Heartland, we believe that everyone was made for meaningful friendships and community. And small groups are how we do that here, by growing with and caring for each other. We have Bible studies, hobby groups, freedom groups, and more. 
Our small group directory goes live next Sunday, January 29th. So be thinking about what kind of small group you'd like to be a part of, or even what kind of group you'd like to lead. You can text the word GROUPS to 68000 to register your group and to sign up for small group leader training, which will take place the next two Sundays at 9 a.m. This new season of the year is the perfect time to get connected and jump in. Our annual Married Night Out is coming up on Friday evening, February 10th. We're looking forward to an incredible night with the engaged and married couples of our church and invite you to this completely free, yes, free event. This will be such a fun evening and you will come away with some practical tools and some spiritual principles to help strengthen your marriage and family. Childcare will be provided, but space is limited. So you need to register your children and RSVP for you and your spouse for the event by texting MNO to 68000 or by going to heartlandchurch.com slash MNO. It's going to be a great night. Can't wait to see you there. Again, we're so happy that you're here and we pray God's blessings over you because today is gonna be a great day. Well, hello, everybody. So good to see you. I'm so glad you're here for uh, day 15 of the 21 days of prayer and fasting. But before I go any further, there are some great things coming up for you to be a part of. Church is not a service you go to. It is a community. It's a way. It is a it is a life. It's, it's something that happens Monday through Friday. We would love for you to be a part of it. Just a big shout out to all of you for your generosity that makes a place like this uh, happen. It doesn't happen without your generosity. And I wanna say thank you to you. You just heard about this incredible uh, married night out that's coming and we really feel that we wanna invest in marriages right now. It's a tough time for marriages in America. And in the past, you know, we would uh, charge to make that event happen. And this year we're like, no, Everybody needs to come. So you already paid for it. You already gave your tithes and offerings. You all register and show up. We're going to have an amazing night as we pour into your lives and help strengthen your marriage. Also, uh, the 21 days of prayer and fasting has one more week left. We are going to be here 6 o'clock tomorrow morning for day 16. It looks like this. Uh, it's not a prayer meeting with a few people. The whole church comes. I'm seeing families bring their little children and yesterday, I had tears rolling down my face seeing the love that people were expressing to God, the way God was touching people's hearts, people being prayed for, hundreds of people walking around, uh, experiencing the presence of God. If you've never been to any kind of prayer meeting, it's not like a Sunday morning. It's even better than that. It is better. It is better. And I encourage you to come see for yourself. One of these days... Monday through Friday, then Saturday is the big finale. It's at nine o'clock. Uh, because it's prayer and fasting, it's a day we break the fast. We'll have some great food, and it'll be a great, great morning. We'll share communion together. We'll pray for healing. We'll pray over all of your children. So bring your kids out and be a part of uh, Saturday's grand finale, the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Hey, if you're a student, if you're between the ages of uh, seventh grade and a senior in high school. Uh, small groups for you guys have already started, so they meet right here uh, at 1145 uh, till one. Student small groups meeting in the kitchen. So the north entrance, it says staff offices. Kitchen is right behind that. Go ahead there and uh, be a part. In fact, if you're online and you want to send your kids, send them. It's a, it's a great great way for your kids to be connected with the right people and to be connected with some friends that are going in the same direction. And then one more thing, I'm teaching the Grow Track Live, which is our, our membership class, if you will. It's a, it's, but only one of the sessions is about the Heartland story. The other two classes are about you discovering the calling of your life. And I am just so convinced with the way things are today in this world. If you know who you are and you know what your calling is, your mental health is in a totally different place. You need to know why you're on this planet. God has made you with a purpose and for a purpose. So I'm going to meet with whoever shows up today at noon for Grow Track Live. It's a new version of it. We're going to connect you to uh, places to use those callings and use those gifts that God has given you. And I'd love for you to be a part of that. It's just free. You don't have to pay. You just come. All right? 
So I'll see you there. Now, announcements are over. I want you to be prepared for the Word of God. I want to talk to you again about being led by the Spirit and what voices not to listen to. So uh, we want to worship. Um, I mentioned giving at the top of this little announcement package here that it's all worship. And thank you again for your generosity. That's worship too. It's all worship to God. Worship is simply saying to God, God, everything I am, everything I have comes from you. And so even your opportunities, your education, the job you have, the house you have, everything comes from God. All God wants is for us to acknowledge him. And when you put him first in your life, when you acknowledge God in every area of your life, God will bless you because then you know that you're not just a cul-de-sac of his blessings, you're a conduit of his blessings to the world. So you gotta learn that principle and God will pour out his blessings upon you. So if you'd like to give in any way, you can do that by texting simply the word give to the number 68,000 and that's how we do offering here at Heartland Church. And so that's part of the worship, you can do that while uh, we worship now, but I'm gonna ask Pastor John to come out and he's gonna sing a song. It's still my favorite song. I still listen to it every day. I asked him to sing the goodness of God today. I think it goes perfect with what I'm speaking about. So put your hands together. Welcome, Pastor John. He's gonna sing. And if you wanna stand, if you wanna worship God, if you wanna, y'all, just play. Like, don't hold back. Like, play this and lead people in worship. Do your thing. All right, from the heart. Oh, your mercy never fails me All of my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God In darkest nights, you were close like no other. God, I've known you as a father, and I've known you as a friend. And I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing it out real big together. Come on, say. Lord, all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Yes, you have. With every breath that I am able, Lord, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, I hear you this morning. Let's sing it one more time. All my life. Because all my life you have been faithful. And I'm thankful that you have, yes, all my life you have been so, so good, Lord. And with every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yes, Lord, because your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you everything. Because your goodness is running after, yes, it's running after me. Come on, sing it out, say, your goodness is running after, it's running after. Yes, it is. See, your goodness is running after. With my life laid down. Oh, Lord, your goodness is running after. Come on, sing that again. Oh, because your goodness is running after me. Yes, Lord. Yeah, this one. 
we give you glory and say, yes, all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Yes, you have with every breath that I Of the goodness of God, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I get everybody to stand to your feet and just praise him for his goodness, worship him for his faithfulness. Tell him how much you love him and how much you appreciate him. Give him all the glory. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the honor. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Lord, we open our hearts to you. We surrender now. We want you to speak to us. All week long, we have heard voices that call us away from you, that drive our fears, that manipulate our minds. And today, Lord, we're asking for a place in a, in a moment just to hear you. I pray that you would conquer every spirit of fear, every screaming voice of condemnation, every voice of discouragement, of depression, whatever is speaking, silence those voices now and let the spirit of Jesus, oh, you have such a clear whisper, there's nothing evil, nothing dark, nothing condemning about your voice, so speak to us now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God has been so good to you, even when you didn't know it, even when you weren't searching after him, even when you weren't following him, he loved you and he knows you. He's a good father who loves you and wants you to be his child. We see pictures of the heart of God through scripture, how he treats his own son. In Matthew chapter three, you, you see this scripture where Jesus was baptized and his father says, you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. And that's the same voice, that's the, that, that applies to you. If you decide that you're going to make God your father through Jesus Christ, his son, and what he did on the cross, the father says those very words to you. The problem is, I don't think you hear that voice very often. I think you hear other voices. I think the voice of the Spirit is constantly saying to you, you're the beloved of God. In fact, as a Christian, you want to build your life on that rock and run back to it after every failure. God knows every sin you've ever done and all the ones you're going to do. And God has this great, great love for you. He'll even lead you sometimes to things that you don't like because he's got a greater purpose. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Do you notice in the scripture, Jesus was led by the Spirit after his baptism, after God had just said, I love you. With you, I'm well pleased. And he was led by the Spirit to go meet the devil. <laughs> Jesus goes not where Jesus wants to go. Jesus goes where the Spirit leads him. I'm trying to teach you in this year to learn how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's a brand new year. It cannot be business as usual. It cannot be where you used to be. It's a, it's a new time. It's a new world. We've never been here before. Right. It's different. Yes. And uh, new year, new opportunity, new levels, new devils, they used to say. And you're going to be challenged. And actually, God is going to lead you into some of it because he wants to prove to you that you're the beloved of God. I want to teach you how to hear his voice. In fact, I wanted to teach you about the Holy Spirit, this whole series here, 
but I kept thinking about, it's not that you don't want to hear the Spirit, it's that you don't know how to recognize the voice of fear. And it drives you, it's constantly, it's constantly driving you. The scripture says God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. But I don't think people are, are listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, even Christians. I mean, you are a believer, you love God, but Christian or not, people are listening to that voice of fear now more than they ever have before. And what is the end game of the spirit of fear? Like, what's the whole goal? What's he trying to do? He's trying to control you. He's trying to manipulate you. So here you are, a believer in Jesus, a Christian. You're going to give your life to him and follow him, go to church, try to raise a family with, with Christ in your heart. But a spirit of fear driving your life, you, you will end up being manipulated and controlled into behavior that you don't even believe in things you don't want to do, but you keep doing, and there's something that's speaking to you, and usually it's, it's fear. So that is our definition of the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear is trying to take control of you through knowledge. He knows all about you. He knows what you've done wrong, so he tries to tell you, you're not beloved of God. Look at who you are. you got to prove something. You're not enough. Wow. That thing that happened before, it's happening again. You better take matters into your own hands. Knowledge, shame, and fear. Now, last week, I started this little, little uh, I guess it's a detour or a pause, just to say I want to talk about these hindering spirits. I wanted to show you what it's like when a person gives over to a spirit of fear. If you allow this to happen, you become a person that is controlled, is manipulated. Before long, you'll actually be an agent of the devil himself doing his work. Literally, he's controlling you demonically through the spirit of fear, and you're, you're a Christian, but, but you're hindering the work of God in your own life, and you're hindering the work of God in the church, and you're hindering the work of God in other people. The Bible has a word for that. We talked about it last week. When, you're, when, a, when someone's being controlled demonically, or the goal of that, it's witchcraft. Same thing. So last, last week, I'm not going to repeat all of this. You can go back and catch the whole background. But for witchcraft to work, there has to be an idol. Now, an idol is something that you feel you have to have, whether God wants you to have it or not. You'll do anything to get it. It's an obsession. And I'm not just talking about money or a certain kind of a car. I think people make promises. When, when bad things happen, when people go through pain, which all of us have, when we've experienced rejection, when we've had some kind of an of a, of a issue, we make promises to ourselves unconscious promises and we say well that will never happen again I will never not be in control ever again and then we live our lives with an obsession that I got to be in control no matter what and so last week last week I talked about how people who have hurt happen to them sometimes it's even instigated by the devil himself that becomes a wound, that wound becomes a fear, that fear now uh, is replaced by an idol, and through that idol, the, the enemy can actually manipulate you. I asked you last week a question. What do, you act, what do you really have to have in your life to feel safe? What do you really need in your life to be somebody? What do you really need in your life to be secure? It's a great question, because it may reveal that if it's anything other than God, you may have an idol. And if you have an idol, you can be manipulated and controlled. So let me give you a little definition that's so clear. So this is something new. You can, it's not in your notes, but you can write it in your notes. A hindering spirit is someone who, after listening to that voice of fear so long, they become demonically manipulated. They're a controlled person. And literally, without even realizing it, they're doing the devil's work. And so last week, I started talking to you about these different characters in the Bible personifications of people who have become hindering spirits. And they're a type. So we look at a person like Herod and we say, oh, we see that that spirit is alive and well in the world today. And so I want to talk to you about, I'm going to recap a couple of them that we did. I'm going to give you a couple more in the time that we have. If you missed it, go back and watch last week's message. But today, let's just recap King Herod. King Herod was a successful king. I mean, they called him Herod the Great. And he was a builder. He built masterpieces. He rebuilt the temple. It became a wonder of the ancient world. 
You can't go anywhere in the, in, the, in the Bible lands and not find evidence of what Herod built. He was, he was successful. Money, size, like he is, he is saying through these building projects, you will not ignore me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big, I'm big, I'm important, and I matter. But he was tremendously insecure. He never felt like he fit. And so anytime he felt threatened or he felt like he was losing his power, he was murderous. He was brutal. There was no line that he would draw. I mean, whatever, if it means killing babies, we're going to have, I will not be threatened. So, so his fear is insignificance, like his power going away. And his idol is, I will do whatever it takes to stay in power. Spirit of Herod. Now, Herod does not believe in God. He, he's not a, he doesn't believe in God, but he doesn't mind using God to accomplish his agenda. Because Herod's going to do whatever he has to do to get his agenda accomplished. So, he, like, like, he doesn't trust God, but he builds a temple for God. Why? Not because he, he wants to build a temple for God, but because he knows it will please the people and the people will like him. And he'll do something for them, and so they'll go, oh, we need this guy. And there, are, there has always been religious leaders and high priests like Caiaphas and their ilk and others who will throw their lot in and get in bed with Herod because they will say, we can use Herod for our agenda. These are people who believe in God, but they don't believe that God will provide what they need. They need government to provide it. So, so, so they, they will, they're not above using Herod to get their agenda, and Herod's not above using them to get their agenda. Now, Jesus, in his day, he just ignores all of it. He ignores them. He's just, he's on mission for his father. He's not impressed. And they're like, how can you not be impressed at this temple? And he's like, the day's coming. Not one of these stones of the temple is even going to be on another. Because y'all, it was supposed to be a house of prayer. Y'all have turned it into a den of thieves. So they're like, well, aren't you? Wait a second. He built us the temple. Don't you see what he's accomplished? Don't you see what he, he's done for us? And Herod always has his defenders. And Jesus is like, look, look. Many are going to come on that day and say, look what I built and look what I did and look what I accomplished in God's name. And, and God's going to say, I never knew you. You didn't know me. You're just using my name to accomplish your agenda. Literally, go read Matthew 24 and 25. It's talking about Herod and Jesus making that statement. It's in the same chapter. So I'm just saying that that spirit is one of the hindering spirits. It's a, it's a murderous spirit that's afraid of losing power and will do whatever it takes to stay in power. Then there's the spirit of Jezebel we covered yes, uh, last week. And Jezebel doesn't want to be king or doesn't want to be out in front, doesn't want to have the notoriety, doesn't need to build anything big, but they're going to be behind the scenes. This is your classic behind-the-scenes manipulator who wants to have the power. They just don't want to be known. It operates in the dark, in the shadows, but it is a murderous spirit too. There is nothing it won't do to get its agenda. I mean, perjure yourself, lie, murder somebody, have somebody killed, um, outright oppose God's people. They, it will do whatever. And we don't know the story. The scripture doesn't tell us, but somewhere in Jezebel's life, there was a moment where young Jezebel was taken advantage of, or she felt weak, or she felt like she was a pawn. And you, you, you can't read it in the story, but you can't not see it, that this is a person that said one time, I will never not be in control. So let me put it to you this way. Her, 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 her fear is ever appearing weak or vulnerable. No one's going to mess with me. And her idol is to be in control. Again, I see these spirits. And, and you got to learn how to like see the person and then see the spirit that's behind them driving it. I want to give you some new ones today. Okay, we're going to start right into today. I think you're going to like this. Um, there's a spirit called simony. It's not from Simon Peter. It's from a guy called Simon of Samaria. And the word simony actually came into play in the Middle Ages when there was a lot of people buying 
spiritual offices for money. So like if I give you 100,000 goats, you will become the bishop of Lombardy or something, you know, and you could literally buy yourself into being a bishop. So this word simony came into play, and, it's, and what it is, it's the purchase of a spiritual office. If you give, I will give you spiritual authority in the church if you give me money. So let me tell you his story. There was a man named Simon, and he'd been a sorcerer. So he's like the witch doctor in his particular town. He was the magician for many years, and he amazed the people of Samaria. He claimed to be somebody great. So right there, you notice that that's, that's what he wants. He, he needs to be somebody. He wants to be great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one. The power of God, which he loved. That's what he lived for. He loved being the man. He w- that's what he wanted, to be the most influential person. Fear me, respect me, I don't care, but I will be the great one. And so they listened closely to him because for a long time he'd astounded them with his, with his magic. But now the people believe Philip's message. Philip was one of the original 12 apostles He goes to Samaria after Jesus is resurrected, and he starts preaching in Simon's town, and the whole town believes the message of the good news concerning the kingdom of God and the the name of Jesus Christ. So this is a demotion for Simon and his town because all the people first believe in Philip, and then they believe in Jesus. That moves like Simon down to third. He's no longer the guy. And he starts to feel that. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Now, Simon, he gets caught up in it. And I want you to notice, it doesn't say he pretended to believe. He actually believed. He saw the power of God. He believed and was baptized. Just because you believe and are baptized doesn't mean that the issues and the wounds of yesterday aren't still controlling your life. And it doesn't mean, just because you believe and you're baptized doesn't mean the enemy can't Manipulate those fears and idols to try to get you to do his agenda. So I have a kind of compassion for this guy. He probably doesn't know why he is the way that he is. All he knows is he's got a great need to be somebody, and he sees his influence starting to slip away. So he begins following Philip wherever he went. He was amazed, so he believed, and he was in awe of the power of God, the signs, the great miracles that Philip performed. When the apostles heard that revival was breaking out in Samaria and that the Samaritans had received the word, they sent to them Peter and John, those, the, the, the leaders of the apostles. And what happened was they started to pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, now watch this, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to watch this. He's not saying this. He's not saying, I want the Holy Spirit so badly, I'll give everything. I mean, all my money, I'll I'll give it all. Just give me the Holy Spirit. It's not what he's saying. What's he saying? He's saying, give me this power so that I lay my hands. What he wants is revealed. This is a person who's realizing that I've just been demoted to now fifth place. First Philip, then the message of Jesus. And now uh, Peter and John show up and they're talking about the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he keeps losing influence and this anxiety begins to bubble up. So he's willing to say, let me have this power so that when he wants to insert himself, he wants, he wants other people to receive God through him. They will receive the Holy Spirit. His fear, his fear is insignificance. I got, I'm not going to be anybody anymore. Who will I be if I'm not the great one? And so what he really wants is power. He wants influence. He wants to be the one who can you know, impress people. So Peter has a response for him. Peter says to him, may your money perish with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. Our English Bible sometimes cleans stuff up in a way that is palatable to a bunch of, you know, church people. That's not what, that's, that's not what he said. The word perish is the word hell. 
okay? So what he's saying is, take your money back to hell where you came from. That's the, that is the literal, if you want to get literal and look at the Greek, that's, he's literally saying, take you and your money, go back to hell where you came from. Now, you got to understand, he's not, he's not being as harsh as you think, though. Because there was a time when Jesus said to Simon Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was saying, there's a spirit talking through you right now, and I recognize it, and I'm going to speak to the spirit that put that thought into your head. So what he's saying here is he's looking, dude, I see what is going on here. There's a spirit that's speaking to you and manipulating you, and I speak to that spirit and say, take that thought back to hell where it came from, to the devil, to hell where it, where it was instigated. Because what he's really trying to say is, give me this power so that I can be the source. There, if you listen, if you learn to recognize these spirits and to see them, see, that's what I'm trying to help you do. If you can just see them, if you could just... If you could just learn to recognize when the spirit of fear is talking to you, because it has a tone, it has a shrillness, there's always a threat involved, and if you can see it, you can reject that spirit. You can say, no, that's not the spirit of God. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, I speak to them, they listen to me, and they don't listen to the voice of the stranger. But I'm afraid a lot of people don't even know, they think, because the stranger will come and talk in your voice. Yeah. And he will use your, your tone, and, and he'll try to trick you. But you've got to learn how to recognize it when there's a spirit talking. I, this is a dangerous spirit. This is a spirit that talks religious. This is a spirit that will show up in church all buttoned up and look right. But it wants, to be in, it wants power in the church. It wants control. I had a person literally in my office at one point in the early years of our church, and he said to me, I want to begin the conversation by reminding you of who is the largest tither in this church. I, I thought I had the devil in my office. Because immediately I recognized there is a voice, there's a spirit behind that that this guy didn't even recognize. But if anybody walks into your and says, listen, I just want you to know that I am your source. That's what he was trying to tell me. And I'm like, I'm, he's not my source. God is my source. God is the source. But if I had had an idol of, of fear of losing that money, I could have been manipulated. And if I was manipulated, the whole church could be manipulated by one person who's a hindering spirit. Y'all got to see this. All it takes is one. And then if you have an idol in your life, you can be manipulated by a hindering spirit. So I said right there, I said, listen, I am so grateful for all you've done. You need to know that. I love you, appreciate you. I'd hate to see you leave the church over this. Because this is the direction we're going. And I'm sorry if you don't like that. And I never saw him again. He did leave. He was gone. Never. That was it. Took his money and went elsewhere. But I thank God that I have uh, an upbringing and I have a relationship with God and I understand, I know how to recognize a spirit that's not from God. Listen, friends, God is my source. He has provided for me all of my life. He's been faithful. All my life, he's been good. I don't, I don't, I, no man is my source. God is my source. And that makes this, it makes, it makes safety for you. A strong church is a safe church. And so, so, so this is what Peter says. He says, I want you to take that thought and get it out of here and be gone. And so the church is protected. And this man actually becomes humble because here's the thing. Don't get this wrong. It's not the guy. Most people who have this, who operate with this today, they just want to be somebody. There's something driving them. And they don't know why, but there's a wound in their life, a hurt. Somebody took advantage of them. Somebody... They felt less than, and now they're just going church to church looking for someone, some church, some people that, where they can be somebody. You just have to learn to try to help people like that. But what it's required is a confrontation. That's hard for us to do. Let me give you another spirit. I hope you're enjoying this, but I want to help you see something. There's another type of hindering spirit in the Bible. It's the spirit of Absalom. Absalom is the third son of King David by a, a wife named Maka. David had a bunch of wives. And so his third son is born to him. Uh, and, and it's a tragic story. You read this story, 
uh, and Samuel, or, or Absalom, sorry, Absalom tries to overthrow his dad, tries to kill his father, tries to take the kingdom. It's a sad, sad story. And um, Absalom is motivated. You know, he's, he's supposed to love his dad. A son is supposed to love the father. Father's supposed to love the son. So I want to tell you this tragic story and help you see the this, this spirit that's behind it. First of all, let's just get to know Absalom. What was he like? What kind of a young man is he? Absalom bought a chariot and horses, and he hired 50 bodyguards to run ahead of him. Okay, so right there, this is kind of revealing to you. The spirit here is very um, self-promoting. This is a person that likes to promote themselves. Somebody great is coming. He would have a big Instagram account today, okay? This is somebody <laughs> who knows how to self-congratulate and uh, self-celebrate and self-promote. And what he would do is he'd get up early in the morning and he'd go out to the gate of the city. Now, the gate of the city is where business deals were done, where judges sat and handed out judgments when people had disputes. So he went to the city gate, and when people brought a case to the king for judgment, so the king's representatives are there, his judges are there, Absalom would kind of come up to people waiting in line, and he would ask them, hey, where are you from? What's your name? And then he would say, man, sounds like you've got a real case there. This is nothing but pure politicking right there. This is, this is a, a tactic called alliance building. Like you are, through your agreement and through your networking and through your, you're trying to make a connection to let people know, hey, I'm on your side. Sounds like you got a really good case here. Alliance building, politicking. That's the way you can see it. If you see somebody doing that, it might be the spirit of Absalom. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I'm sorry you have to wait in this line. I'm, this is taking forever. I mean, I wish someone would, would help you. I wish I were the judge. You know, I wish that dad, I mean, he never wants to delegate any authority. The powers that be. When you hear that phrase, talking about the upper ups or the powers that be, if, if I wish that I was the judge because then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment and then I would give them justice. This is a word that's probably not used a lot in your vocabulary, but if this is demagoguery. This is, this is playing on the emotions and the prejudices and the fears of people to manipulate. So he's saying, he's saying look, look, the king wants to hoard power. You're nobody to him. So he's preying on that fear. People, who, people who, are, who need justice often feel like no one's listening to me. And he's going, you're right. No one is listening. I wish I were the king. I would listen to you. I would give you justice. I'd make sure that you got the attention that you deserved. Demagoguery. Then people would bow down before him, and Absalom wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by the hand, and he kissed them. So he's like, no, 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 what are you doing? We're just, I'm just a man like you. Don't bow. Stop bowing. I'm your brother. I'm Absalom. Just call me by my first name. I'm Abs. You know, we're just, we're pals. <laughs> now, this sounds like humility, but in fact, it's false humility because this is the guy that had 50 people out running in front of him announcing, I'm the man. I mean, you know he's not humble, but this is false humility telling people, hey, look, come here, let me hug you. Let me just kiss you. We're, we're don't, I hate all this formal stuff. I hate the way the king makes it about him all the time. I hate, I hate the way that he's up there and, and I'm, I'm here with you. We're, we're just, I'm, I'm, the, I'm with the people. Now, Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment, and in doing so, he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. Now, that was his agenda all along because this is consummate disloyalty. He, he, is, he has an agenda to, like, I am going to take this. The love that was supposed to be for the king, I'm going to take it for me. And the power that the king's supposed to have, I'm going to take that. And this is what happens. He eventually forms a coup, and the king has to run. And it's in what happens next that you, that you find out how wounded this guy is. Because I want you to see something. In one screen here, here's all of the things that we just saw in that passage of Scripture. And what you end up finding out, he's severely wounded. He's a hurt young man. Here's what happened. Here's the backstory. One day, his sister Tamar was raped by King David's oldest son, Amnon. Like, this is a TV show. Y'all be watching, streaming on Netflix. 
and the, the, old, the older brother from a different mother rapes Absalom's little sister, and the king does nothing about it. And he's shocked. Why wouldn't dad do something? The king doesn't do anything, and in fact starts to move Amnon because he's the firstborn into the place of succession. And Absalom's not having it, so Absalom kills Amnon. Now the king is not going to speak to Absalom. He rejects him and says, we're never speaking. I'm, you're dead to me. And this wound begins to take over Absalom's life to the point where he eventually just goes full-blown. He, that fear of rejection, his idol now is revenge. I will, do, I will bring him down. And in the story, what happens next is when he finally does the coup, uh, David has to run. A bunch of his wives are left behind, and he publicly rapes all of them. Yeah. Can you imagine? It's a, this is like an R-rated, like, this is like the show you, 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 you all watch, but it's in the Bible. The Bible's not boring. Y'all might be boring, but the Bible's not boring. <laughs> this kind of stuff is alive. We see it today. Jesus. It's alive. It, it functions in companies and middle management all the time. And, and I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you to see something. If you could see it, maybe you wouldn't just swallow it. Maybe if you, if you saw it, you might confront it. Yeah. And you might say, whoa. See, that what, what kept Jezebel in power, you know what the one thing that, that, ke that keeps all these spirits in power is, is weak leadership. Yeah. They knew who Jezebel was. They, they, people knew what he was doing. People could see it, but just nobody wanted to say anything because they had their own idols. Like, they might come after me. The big idol for people confronting people today is like, well, if I say something, they may make me the target. So you know what? I ain't saying nothing. And this happens in churches all the time. It only takes one hindering spirit to kind of mess up a whole church. Somebody say amen. You were in that church. Because nobody wanted to say anything. Y'all watch the show American Idol. You know what the number one American church idol is? I got your attention. There is a fear that runs through churches, and people have it inside of them. And you know what they fear more than anything? People fear conflict. They don't know how to do it. They know what the Bible says. I don't know how to do that, so I ain't doing it. And because they're afraid of conflict, they make an idol out of friendship. And what friendship, I mean, what I mean is, is like, I need everybody to like me. Everybody needs to like me. I don't want to say or do anything that would cause somebody not to like me because I, I need to be liked. And that becomes an idol. And it keeps people from being courageous and strong and doing what is right. Can I help you here today? This is, what's ha this is what happens. So I've got to help you see it, and then I've got to teach you how to confront it. I've got to teach you how to be strong because, again, a strong church is a safe church. Y'all, look around. This is what God has done and what God is doing is it's a work of the Holy Spirit. I can't really account for it, but it's beautiful and it's amazing. We have a church that's not like any of the churches we came from, and it's different, but we come here because we go, oh my God, this is beautiful. This is, what God is doing here is something I've not seen before. And I just got to train you and teach you how to protect this beautiful thing that we have. Let me tell you a secret. <laughs> If this were an all-white church, like if everybody was, everybody was all white, if, if you get a whole group of white people together in a church, do you know what's going to happen in about a, an hour? Conflict. <laughs> Y'all don't think that's true? It, 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 that is exactly what will happen because they'll do it. They'll, so, so you had a church like this and you put black folk and Hispanic Latino people and Asian people together and you mix this all together, you don't think there's going to be conflict anytime? It's going to happen. It's going to be part of our lives. And the enemy is going to want to manipulate that. And he's going to want to cause division. He wants to sow seeds of discord and distrust and misunderstanding. He wants to prey on the prejudices. He wants to play on the wounds of people that have done in the past. He wants to stir it all up. He may even send a few hindering spirits in among us. And you all have to be ready for it. You've got to be ready to respond to it when you see it. Because the defeat of a hindering spirit is a free you. It's a free church. And that's what I want for. I want you to be free. I want to help. So next week, I'm actually going to take a little bit of the message and teach you how to confront somebody in love. 
because people don't know how to do that. They only know how to blow up at people or say nothing. It's like one or the other. Don't you know that God has a way for this to be done that's beautiful and kind and loving? So we don't have to choose either or. We can just, we can learn how to, how to do it the right way and be the people of God. I'm going to help us grow and mature. I'm also going to spend some time next week talking to you about how to really hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I've taught you how to see the enemy and listen for it, but I want to teach you how to actually hear the Spirit. God says, be still and know that I am God. So i got to teach you how to create a space in your life so that you can hear God better. And we're going to talk about that next week, all right? But let me just wrap this up today and say this. Here's the big idea. God has not given you a spirit of fear. It's not from God. Recognize the tone. Recognize the volume. Recognize when it's dark, when it's evil, when it's, when it's, when it's keeping you up at 3 in the morning and making you feel like you are the worst. And look, and that's embarrassing. And don't you feel ashamed? When you hear that voice, that is not the voice of God. You can rebuke that voice in Jesus' name. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So, so learn, to, learn to hear that voice and say, that voice is not of God. But he also says, he's given you a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Let me, let me show you this in a different way. I don't want to just inspire you today and make you shout. That's great. But I want you to go home and do something about this. I want you to, I want you to appropriate this into your life, okay? So, so for that to work... Back this up. If the goal is a sound mind, you need the power of God's word plus the love of God's people in your life. You alone is not enough. That's why God made the church. You need to be a part of it. And this may not be the church for you, but you need to be a part of a community of believers. You don't need just to go to church. You need to be part of the church. If you don't have that, a Christian without a church family is an orphan and can be picked off and is vulnerable and and is subjected to the attacks of the enemy all by themselves. The Bible says two are better than one, yeah. which is why he hates marriage so much, by the way, everybody, because he knows that if the two of you ever got on mission for God, you'd be really hard to stop. That's why I want to help you in your marriage. But when a bunch of you come together, especially from all your different backgrounds and diversity, and you say, we have decided that there's something bigger, which is the mission of God to join together on, that church is almost unstoppable. And what happens when that, when that happens, you are filled with some fearless confidence because you're not alone anymore. So I want you to pray right now about being in a small group in the next season of our church. The church is not a service you go to. You've got to belong to something. You need community. So you need to be at a table eating food with people. And I want you to join a freedom group. I think if everybody in this church went through freedom because everybody has idols, I have an idol, you have an idol. And if we can learn how to see them and know what they are, we will be less likely to be manipulated by the spirit of fear. If we can deal with the fears and the wounds of yesterday, you can become a strong person. You can be free. You don't have to do what the flesh, the impulses, the voice of the spirit says do every time that impulse comes. You can actually learn how to be free. So it's for everybody, and I want you to to pray about being in a freedom group. A week from today, that small group directory goes live. I am planting a seed. Don't just go to church. Be a part of the church and grow, grow. Be Hopefully 10 weeks from now, after freedom, you will be a different person. I know your life will change. Here's Here's what happened. Here's a picture of it. Back to this verse. When they got together and they prayed, and what did they do? The scripture says they told God about the threats. Because remember, the spirit of fear and the hindering spirits are always making threats about something. That's one of the ways you can know that it's the devil's voice. Or when a person talks to you and there's a threat involved, there's like, there's a spirit here. It's not right. So what the people of God did is they went to God and they says, Lord, consider their, their threats. And together they prayed in one accord. And while they were praying, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak God's word with fearless confidence. That is the result of being in a praying community of people who not only know God's word, but they love one another. And you need that desperately. The second thing that you, that you need is not just to be a part of a group, 
but you need to know the calling God has for your life. I am convinced more than ever right now, if you're a young person, if you're a teenager, and you're struggling with mental uh, battles, and you're, you're just down on yourself all the time, and you're, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, discouraged or depressed, you, you struggle with that mental health. Listen, if you only knew who God says you, who you are, and you believed it, and you know what your calling in life is, you would, be, you would have so much more victory in your life. So I want to invite you to come to the growth track at some point. Maybe today is the day you come and you learn what is God's purpose? What's his calling on my life? That's what step three of our growth track is all about. If you haven't been to the other one, you can come to this first one today. I'm teaching it live and I'm going to continue to do it all through this year till every one of you know who you are and know what your calling is. This statistic of 86% of Christians don't know what the calling on their life is, that's not gonna stand at Heartland Church. Not the church I pastor, no sir. Every one of you are gonna know what, who you are and what your calling is, because I know that if you do the thing that God puts you on earth to do, your mind will be right, your health will be there, your fulfillment will be there. Let me put it to you this way, when you know who God says you are and what God has called you to do, sound mind. Doesn't mean you don't have problems, but you have something bigger than your problems to live for. I got a purpose. I have a calling. I know who I am. I know what I'm called to do. Amen, everybody? All right. I'm stopping here. We'll pick this up right here next week. I want to pray for you, so let's just, let's just hold still. I want to pray especially for people who are feeling far from God, and I want to create a little space and a holy moment for every person to experience that. God, I thank you for your word today. I pray, Lord, that whatever it is that you wanna say to each person, target it right to them. In fact, you might pray, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And Lord, as you reveal to them the next step of what you would have them do, God, give them the courage to do it. I pray you'd fill them with peace right now. That sense of confidence, Lord, they are loved by you, they belong to you, and Lord, you have created them with a purpose, for a purpose, and my prayer is that every person in this church is connected to your family and knows what their purpose is in 2023, and I pray right now for the person who's far from you, who doesn't know you personally, maybe they did at one time and they've drifted away, they backslid, but they've come here today with the intent to get right with you. I wanna pray for them and ask you to give them the courage to respond. Today is the day for you to save them and forgive them, for them to be part of your big family. If that's you, I'm praying for you right now. Slip your hand up, just lift it up and put it back down so I can include you in this prayer. Say, that's me, Pastor. I'm responding. I need a real relation with God. I need his forgiveness. I need to come back to him. I'm giving my life to him today. Yes, I see you. Slip it up. Great. Put it back down. Yes, gotcha. Yes, I see you. Yes, I see you over there. 